Well, I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Blair Rubel. I'm director of the Comparative Urban Studies Project, and uh, my colleagues Allison Garland and uh, Lauren Hertzer really uh, pulled the meeting together. So I'd like to thank them, and I'd like to thank uh, Steve McDonald and Howard Volpe and their colleagues at the Africa program for helping out as well. Um, this is uh, really a timely and important subject, and a subject which is uh, worthy of attention within the context of South Africa and within the context of Africa. But I think what we're also seeing is that this gives a window onto some very, to my mind, unfortunate global phenomena as well uh, that we've been seeing and working on uh, issues surrounding the integration of, of migrants in a number of societies and a uh, and heightening accounts of uh, violence against foreigners in a number of, of countries uh, uh, particular we 've been working on issues in Ukraine, but I think uh, clearly there are very serious issues that demand our attention and um, we were very pleased when uh, Lauren uh, suggested that he would be able to come back and visit us and present this work. Lauren is an old friend of the Comparative Urban Studies program and of the Wilson Center, and he's participated in many of our projects. Uh, so uh, as soon as he said he'd been working on this report, we knew it would be uh, a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Steve McDonald, our Wilson Center colleague, for agreeing uh, to serve as a discussant, and, and Whitney Snyderman. Uh, who's President Snyderman and Associates International as well uh, for being a discussant. Uh, this is being, it's being streamed live um, on the web. So it's a little bit like what happened with off-track betting in New York when they started uh, opening up the gambling, uh, the gambling areas with the videos and the racetracks. Uh, many more people are watching this than you might think in this room, but I do want to thank all of you who uh, managed to come out. Uh, weather isn't that bad today, but the, the metro system seems to be in collapse, so uh, that I'm sure has discouraged some people. So welcome to all of you, and I think with all of that, I'm just going to turn it over to Lauren. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Blair, and of course to, to Allison and Lauren for helping to organize this, and, and uh, Stephen Whitney for what I'm sure will be interesting comments and, and suggestions. It's a great opportunity for us uh, to present this, or for me to present this. It's work that we've been doing uh, since the attacks, the major attacks that happened in May of last year that I presume most of you will have heard about, uh, trying to look at, at what really has happened on the ground and what, what's behind it. We are, as Blair said, more inter generally interested in, in migration studies and, and issues of integration and are not experts by any means on kind of urban violence. I think that's a whole other range of uh, kind of inquiry. And we've been left uh, sort of at being asked, what should we do? Uh, you know, we found out what is, what I'll, I'll tell you in a few minutes, is quite a depressing story about the nature of the South African state and its engagement with a newly urbanized domestic and uh, international migrant population. Uh, what do we do from here? I mean, how do we build the mechanisms necessary to prevent future violence? And I, I don't have the answers to that. I have some ideas of what won't work. Uh, most of the things that have been suggested seem uh, not to make much sense to me. But I, I look forward to the comments and suggestions about what might, um, where we might go from here. I think I'll try to keep the presentation brief. If anyone is really interested in more details, uh, I can send you the, the report, which will be formally launched in South Africa uh, in a couple of weeks, but happy to distribute it to anyone uh, now. So I'll, I'll keep it short, and if there's questions, then of course we can deal with that later. Let me first begin. We're supposed to brand everything that we do. So this is, this is us, the Forced Migration Studies Program uh, at Wits University, which uh, is, is broadly looking at, at migration, not just forced migration, uh, and international and domestic. Uh, so one of the major areas of our research has been, as Blair suggested, uh, looking at the intersection of international migration and urbanization and what, uh, what comes out of that good and bad. And I think what I'll talk about today is obviously one of the bad, the downsides. <laughs> so let me then get on uh, just to review quickly the facts of what happened. And I should say that this is one of those presentations that's not suitable for children. Um, you know, because you can see some of the pictures here. Maybe you can't, but I th many of you will have seen uh, 
images like this on the, on the BBC and elsewhere uh, during the attacks of violence that was not just sort of uh, killing of people, uh, but rather you know a very deeply symbolic and overtly uh, kind of performative form of violence, uh, including burning people, hacking them, uh, as you can see, or chasing them with golf clubs, with hammers, this sort of thing. Uh, you know, so as a result of this, well, this, this, these events that you can see the pictures of started off in May 2008, May 11th, um, and, and in Alex, which is a, a small township just, well, it's not small, it's just uh, outside of Johannesburg, or really within Johannesburg, and a few miles from the financial center uh, of South Africa, for the stock exchange and the like. Uh, so very close in proximity to really the heart of the South African state. In the next two weeks, until early June, about 63 people were killed. Forty of these were foreign, uh, and about 20 or 23 were South Africans. And I think this is, this is a critical fact that's often overlooked. And these were not sort of random South Africans that were caught up in the violence, but were South Africans who either resisted the mobs that were chasing the foreigners, or were South Africans that were also deemed to be outsiders or not South African enough. Uh, vendas, petties, certain ethnic groups that come from the border areas who are seen as undesirable uh, or somehow not uh, the right types of people. Uh, just to note that this was, uh, you know, as you would expect, the mob violence didn't pay much attention to people's legal status or how long they'd been in the country. Pretty much if you were foreign and identifiable as an outsider or foreign, uh, you were attacked. In addition to those who were killed, uh, 600 or more wounded, we estimate that there was about 100,000 people uh, who were displaced. 35,000 of these or so were, were ultimately housed in government safety camps or safety sites. They refused to use the word camp. Uh, another 30, the government of Mozambique says 30, 40,000 people came back to Mozambique, Mozambicans, and they also set up camps just outside of uh, Maputo to house some of these people. And then there were reports from Botswana and elsewhere that there were people uh, going there. So we don't really know how many people were displaced. Most were probably displaced within South Africa, uh, went to stay somewhere else. Millions of rand polluted and destroyed. There's hundreds or thousands of houses that were taken over, people's, or all of their possessions if they, that they couldn't carry uh, with them. And of course, none of this has subsequently been uh, returned. And uh, the violence ended with the uh, first wide-scale deployment of the military within South African territory since 1994. Uh, you know, so a, a major crisis by sort of South African standards, although the num it's worth noting that the number of people killed over this two-week period is not actually any higher than the number of people who are normally killed in South Africa during a, a two-week period uh, due to the extremely high crime rate. So it's, it's not so much the, the absolute numbers of people who are killed, but the kind of displacement and the form of the violence in the sense that it was, uh, it was mobs that were definitely outside of, of control of the state. I think what's at stake here is, of course, more than just the rights of a few nationals, but, but broadly the project of, of reconciliation and peacemaking in South Africa, something that is far from complete, uh, and, and the long-term welfare and security of South Africans. As I mentioned, South Africa is not a safe place to live, and the poorer you are, the less safe it is. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an extraordinarily unequal place where there's enormous tensions that have not been resolved, dating back to its history and the contemporary inequalities uh, that are there. I think there's more at stake also than just South Africa. I mean, South Africa is critical to the region's development. Uh, the province of Gauteng, where Johannesburg is, I think accounts for something like 10% of sub-Saharan Africa's GDP. So what happens there has major uh, repercussions for what happens throughout uh, the region. Uh, if Zimbabwe is going to recover ever, it's going to be largely through South African investment, I would suspect, and through remittances from South Africa. Uh, remittances are already keeping a lot of Zimbabweans alive, and if you sort of turn off that tap, uh, the number of people who would be dying or starving in Zimbabwe would increase uh, tremendously. So there's, there's a lot more uh, at stake. Lesotho, 50% of its working age men are in South Africa. Uh, so that whole economy is also fully dependent on, on foreigners being able to find work in South Africa, and the repercussions go on to, to Malawi, all the way up to Kenya, Tanzania, Congo, elsewhere. And I think also there's, there's an issue of why we're all interested in South Africa and that we sort of hope, we have high hopes for it. And it is this sort of moral leadership to some extent of, of Southern Africa, 
Uh, and that, that moral authority has been severely damaged by this within the continent. And I know when, when South African officials travel, they continually ask, like, why are you not nicer to our people? You know, after all we've done for South Africa and to promote it during the dark days, why have you not done more? So the, the South Africa's strong voice in international matters uh, has been hurt. I don't know if you can read this. So this is really what the report is about, is trying to explain uh, why it happened. And in the, the weeks and months that followed, uh, well, really in the hours that followed that first attack in May, which I should note is also was not the first attack, but is something that had been going on for a long time and has continued since, everyone sort of jumped on the bandwagon with their explanations about uh, what was going on. As you can see here, uh, people blaming what was happening in Zimbabwe, criminal elements. The government quickly came out with an argument that it was a third force, which is echoing the kind of uh, apartheid era language of a kind of destabilizing force that was sponsored by the white government uh, to attack the ANC. Uh, others, you know, simply saying that it was really just some criminals and this wasn't a, a broader crisis. Uh, you know, all, I mean, and others, the, the kind of Marxists saying it was, the capital, it was capitalism, others saying it's just administrative failure. So really, there was no clear explanation. Uh, a lot of the early work focused on public opinion and sort of said, well, South Africans are enormously xenophobic, which is something that we have known and is, is undoubtedly true. I think all the survey data show that South Africa is one of the most xenophobic countries, certainly in Africa and, and high up there in the world in terms of people's attitudes. But that doesn't really explain why the attacks happened in certain places, uh, because it didn't happen in most places. It only happened in certain isolated places, even though those opinions are fairly widespread. Uh, a lot of the early uh, research that was coming out, particularly by the Human Science Research Council, which is the equivalent of sort of the NRF or the SSRC here, came up with some very, what we thought were quite dangerous uh, recommendations. I mean, every NGO came up with its recommendations, which was basically like, we need big programs that uh, support what we're doing. But the HSRC came up with this sort of pro, uh, recommendations based on interviews with South Africans said, look, we need to control the borders. This is completely out of control. We should militarize the border. Uh, and this is now one of the proposals that's being mooted during the election. Uh, more public education, just sort of telling people they should be nice to each other. Uh, resettlement outside of South Africa, which at that time particularly we thought would be quite dangerous. Because it's sort of saying the mobs have won. We're going to take all the foreigners out, send that message. Uh, and then what is most worrying, for reasons I'll tell you about in a few minutes, was that they should strengthen local leadership. Uh, and this is people on the ground, in the com uh, street committees, ward committees, uh, local councillors, etc. And while obviously those, those councillors and others have an important role, our research suggests that in most cases those are the ones who are behind the violence. Uh, and so we're deeply afraid that strengthening them would simply empower them uh, to do uh, more damage. So what we set out to do, faced with all of this research, is to try to find out why the violence happened, where, and, and particularly why foreigners uh, were targeted. Uh, I'll just talk very briefly about what we did. Uh, we're under time pressure, but we still managed to go to seven sites. Uh, uh, these are mainly township areas, identified either because violence happened there or because it, they, it, the violence didn't happen in a certain part of these townships, even though violence happened sort of just next door. So to try to understand what was it that stopped the violence from spreading into certain areas and what allowed it uh, to go elsewhere. We had a, a research team that went all over the country, I think saw some pretty miserable and very disturbing things. Uh, they're still traumatized, sort of sit in the corner shaking and, and worried. Uh, but interviews with, with uh, non-nationals, with key informants and focus groups, we tried to interview a lot of the people who were in the safety sites in these camps to try to find out what happened. But most of it was focused on trying to, uh, to the people who were there and speaking to local leaders. And it was not hard uh, to find out what had happened, in part because many of the people we spoke to thought that this was a legitimate activity and is something that should have happened a long time ago, and were in, in some senses quite proud of what they'd managed to achieve. So uh, it wasn't difficult, uh, you know, uh, speaking to all of these people uh, to figure out who had done uh, what. Here's just a few pictures uh, to provide a little bit of context of, of the, these are not all of them, but these are some of the areas where the violence took place. You can see some have been a little bit destroyed, but 
they don't actually look much better than this anyway. Uh, these are very poor areas, largely informal settlements of recently urbanized uh, migrants or people who are uh, South African population has a very high unemployment rate in these areas, 30, 40 percent unemployed, uh, very high um, disproportionate densities of men in these areas, migrant workers and the like. Um, so our key findings, which I'll then explain, uh, was that it, although it did happen in, in very poor areas, it did not happen in the areas that were the poorest of the South Africa, and it did not happen in those areas where there was the most migrants. Uh, in almost all cases, it was associated with localized struggle for control. It was not something that was centrally organized, although it did draw on kind of national rhetoric, which I'll show you in a few minutes. But usually it was a local official who saw that there was something to gain, or local business leaders who felt that they were uh, facing unfair competition uh, from foreign shopkeepers and had then uh, worked with the police and others to try to get rid of those people. The violence itself builds on a long history of violence within South Africa in which uh, gangsterism and other forms of violence has often been justified as a political struggle. Uh, and a lot of what the violence that happened in the 80s had this same character in which it was essentially gangsters who were stealing stuff and saying that this was some part of an anti-apartheid campaign and they've re sort of recycled this rhetoric that this gangsterism is also seen as part of a bigger political uh, project. This is where we get to the solutions which are less certain. Uh, while, we are, while we're quite determined that the, the politics are locally driven, that we're not going to be able to resolve this simply by working with the local leaders. And this is for the reason I mentioned before, that those local leaders are still there and they were the ones who were responsible for the violence and all of the incentives that promoted the violence in May and before and after are still there. Uh, and so that we need to deal with a, a sort of more national intervention that changes the incentive structures for the people working at the local level. That said, we recognize that the South African government is in a very difficult position politically, especially facing an election. As I mentioned, this violence was broadly legitimate among a lot of South Africans. And any effort that's seen as helping to promote the integration of migrants or other unpopular groups is going to cost people uh, local legitimacy. Uh, and so they're in a difficult position, and many of the people in government know what needs to happen or have some ideas, but will overtly tell you that they can't do it, at least uh, for the time being. All right. So let's, let me go back, step back then, and talk about where it happened. Uh, by way of background, here is a map uh, the darker areas, if you can see, are where the non-national populations are based. Uh, it didn't happen in all of those areas. You can see near the Zim border, up to the northeast, uh, is obviously a very dense area near the Lesotho border, near the Mozambican border. This is from the 2001 census. This is more useful. Um, this is a map that shows where recent migrants have come uh, in the last few years. And here you see the densities are not around the border areas as much as around Johannesburg and particularly around Cape Town. And this map, if you, if you, um, this is of non-nationals, but it looks very similar if you would add nationals, uh, internal migration. The same areas would be dark. Uh, so it, it's foreigners and South Africans converging in informal settlements and uh, cities over the last five to ten years. And that's where the violence um, happened. Usually it happened in areas where there are identifiable cleavages. Some of the most, most heterogeneous areas were peaceful, and I'll talk about that for a moment, in part because there was not one group that recognized that they could mobilize effectively against another. Usually the violence happened where there was a single cleavage. In some instances that was between the ANC and the Nkata Freedom Party. In others it was where there was sort of strong ethnic uh, cleavages. We've also seen that these are areas with enormous disaffection. We've started this analysis, but it seems that there's a very strong correlation between the, the areas where the violence happened and areas where people don't vote. It's basically where people no longer believe in the political system and have started to build authority structures outside of it. Trying to explain why it was outsiders, because most of the violence, they said it was really about job creation, it was about getting access to houses. So why is it that you attack foreigners and not the people who actually have those things. 
part of this is a history of outsiders being coded as dangerous. And this goes back to the apartheid era in which South Africa was isolated and, and justified white rule by saying that Africans were sort of dangerous and, and not to be trusted. But even post-apartheid, you have a, 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 an official rhetoric. And these are just some statements, which I, I won't read. You can read them if you're interested. You know, in which foreigners are basically seen as, as devils. I mean, anything, their simple presence in the country is going to undermine the whole process of transformation and um, finding jobs, providing security. Uh, and this is something that has continued uh, today. Um, there is, as a result of that, uh, a sense of competition, and this came up over and over again for jobs, for houses, particularly publicly funded houses. And one of the odd things was this sort of sense that they're stealing our women, which is, of course, plays on all sorts of weird gender ideas um, about you know women somehow being ours or someone else's. But this was something that uh, continually came as justifications, obviously uh, some sort of threatened masculinity behind uh, the violence. The crisis in Zimbabwe seemed to have had a, a major role in pushing people beyond a tipping point. This wasn't because there was actually more people necessarily in those particular townships, but there was a sense that the South African government wasn't dealing with the Zimbabwean issue. They weren't providing assistance, uh, and Tabu Mbeki had basically said, you have to get used to having these people here, uh, and people felt that was, um, was not appropriate. We also saw at that time, this was very close to the end of Thabo Mbeki's rule of South Africa. He had just lost control of the ANC party a few uh, weeks, a few months before. And there was a sense that uh, Jacob Zuma would understand the needs of people and didn't have this sort of sympathies to foreigners that Thabo Mbeki had formed while he was in exile. Uh, and you saw this even in the months preceding the attacks in which the police were refusing to refu recognize refugee papers and immigration documents, saying those are Mbeki papers. We now have Jacob Zuma, and you're going to need Zuma papers. Right? And so there was this sense that uh, we can get away with this, that uh, the, this kind of idea of our borders being open to everyone is, is finished. Uh, of course, this is how South Africans protest. You know, the French go on strike. Uh, Americans have their marches. When South Africans are unhappy with how things are, they go out and they riot. I mean, this is something that has happened over and over again going back into the 80s, uh, and, and that, that's what's happening. And lastly, and I'll address this a little bit later, is this impunity. The violence against foreigners has been going on for years. As far as we know, no one has been prosecuted for it. In most instances, people who are arrested for it have gotten out. Uh, it's deeply popular, uh, deeply legitimate within the communities, uh, and no one is going to stand up uh, and speak against someone who goes and attacks foreigners. So th this is a very safe uh, scapegoat. In the areas where we worked, I mean, that was the sort of general context. Obviously, this also happened at a time when food and fuel prices were skyrocketing. It was in the middle of winter when it was very cold. Uh, a lot of tensions. We had just had an electricity crisis. Uh, you know, so there was a lot of stuff going on, the kind of perfect storm. But the violence didn't happen everywhere, even in places that were harder off. What we found in the places where it happened was uh, that the community leadership was up for grabs. In some instances, this was because the elected leadership uh, was from a different group and simply didn't come to these areas. And so people were forming their own kind of self-rule uh, mechanisms. In other places, it was where there was a conflict between two leaders, and one leader was looking uh, to gain support, and did this by uh, either scapegoating foreigners, which is, a, I think, a, a sort of international trend, uh, but also by trying to steal their stuff so that he could redistribute that to his supporters. Um, so this is one of the things we, we saw. <coughs> In these areas, you also have that the local government, the official local government and the police are largely absent. They will tell you that in many of these areas, they're afraid to enter. They won't go there because the, essentially the streets are controlled um, by self-appointed gangsters and other areas. Uh, there's a part outside of Pretoria that's now called Jeffville, sort of like a Wild West, this guy named Jeff Radebe, who has appointed himself as the leader of this township and has set up an office, uh, I couldn't find the picture, that has Jeffville on it. And he is, you know, everyone knows that if you want to do something there, you go through him. 
Uh, and so the, these are the sort of structures that are there on the ground. Uh, as a result, and not surprisingly, you don't have much in the way of conflict resolution mechanisms. People are disaffected with the party structures. They're disaffected with their ward councillors, uh, which has led to vigilantism and mob justice uh, around crime, but uh, also around uh, foreigners. We also saw that there seems to be a legacy. In the areas where the violence happened, there had been violence before, often in the 1980s uh, during the political violence, but this was, uh, or during the political transition, but there was a sort of, um, you know, some sort of background uh, to this. And in many instances, the people who had gained political leadership during that violence were the ones who had continued to be in power in these areas since then. And so they got away with it in the 80s, in the early 90s, and they, they think they can get away with it um, now. We also see a history of, of sort of local authorities supporting what is essentially illegal practices, stealing people's uh, stuff, limiting uh, ownership of, foreign ownership of, of businesses and things uh, like that. I think this is one of the, the sort of where, I mean, it's, this is the only part of the real research I'll talk about, but this was in Alexandra Township. What you had in one part of the township was the violence taking place, and then just next door, uh, this community leadership standing up and saying the violence wouldn't take place. Uh, and I think we can learn a lot from this. Setswetla is the area where the violence didn't happen and is actually worse off in terms of development and, and service delivery. So it's, you know, again, showing that it's not just poverty. Uh, it is also more diverse in terms of language groups and population. Uh, and the, the political opposition is not as strong. So in some ways, this, you know, you would think that this might be a, a place where you'd have violence. Uh, there are more foreigners there. Uh, and in both areas, it's not that the people there actually like the foreigners. They also really deeply dislike them and are mistrustful uh, of them. But for some reason, it didn't... Um, you know, they, they didn't um, uh, they, they, they didn't attack them but they rather uh, defended them and what you saw in that particular community was the sense in which they had brokered and they realized that there was a danger if they started attacking foreigners they might also attack a lot of South Africans and so they stood up against the gangs that were trying to come in they actively worked with the foreign population to get them out peacefully and safely and then protected their belongings and allowed those people to come back in a few days later. Uh, but part of this has to do with the fact that, um, that, that, and I use this word attached, this is something South Africans say, when you take someone's stuff, you attach it. Um, you know, but this, is, this is, uh, suggests that the community leadership really can make the difference. The community leaders in this case were widely legitimate, even though it's a very heterogeneous community uh, and, and because the political opposition wasn't so strong, there wasn't those cleavages. So they could try to work uh, with everyone, and everyone sort of followed on. And this is the pattern that we saw elsewhere, where the violence was resisted and didn't happen. You had community leadership structures that were linked to the population, and people actually respected them. Often they were elected instead of sort of self-appointed uh, gangsters. Those gangsters were a mob, obviously. A lot of men, but also a lot of women. Uh, and, and they weren't sort of just a spontaneously formed mob, as the South African government tried to suggest immediately after. They were, as we're saying, a, a sort of a mob with a purpose. They were organized um, before. Many instances, the people who were leading were people who had been involved in, in the political struggle before or continued to present themselves as kind of community or political uh, leaders. In many instances, you had, as I mentioned, the, the actual ward councillors and committee, street committees, helping to, or, or the chambers of commerce, helping to organize these mobs, uh, sometimes in collaboration with the police, to go around and they knew exactly where all of the foreigners were and they moved from house to house uh, and they attacked them. We asked, you know, what did the, in some of these places, what did the community leaders do to help prevent the violence? And this was what one of the respondents says, no, 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 you're all, basically you're all wrong. The leaders were there. They were helping to show us where the foreigners lived. They were helping to tell us what we could take and who could get what. Right? And these are the leaders who are still there and the leaders that the HSRC and others have said we need to promote in order to, to help uh, fight this kind of attacks. Getting close to the end, but we'll, we'll look at what happened immediately afterwards and whether there was something done 
to prevent this from happening again. And just quickly to say, there's not, uh, very little has been done, and we fully expect that this kind of violence in one form or another could easily happen again. Uh, we're deeply concerned that with the election and the sort of first really competitive election uh, since 1994, that a lot of the protests and political mobilization that are happening uh, will lead to violence against foreigners or other groups. Um, so basically what happened? The police came in. You saw all those pictures there of the police. The police were shooting tear gas, but they never really intervened. Uh, they, they tried to contain the violence to some extent, but then allowed it to continue. We spoke to some police who said, what do you expect us to do? We spent the last 15 years trying to establish our legitimacy with these communities. If we go in and now tell them they have to stop hurting foreigners, we'll never be allowed back in the community again. Right? So they realized that they were also sort of torn. Uh, so they, they just tried to contain uh, the violence. In some instances, they didn't really even try to contain. They got fully on board and went along with the looting, uh, helping uh, in the name of trying to protect foreigners, taking them out of their houses so that they ostensibly wouldn't get hurt, uh, while the others went in and, and looted. You know, so the police were deeply and directly involved um, and when we spoke with them, what was most worrying is that they didn't feel that they had done anything wrong. You know, that on the street level police, they thought this was a legitimate thing. They didn't see that they could have done anything else. Uh, in the, the weeks and months that followed, in many instances, um, the reintegration of these people was not possible. Uh, clearly, a lot of foreigners didn't want to go back were deeply scared. Some had lived in these communities for years and then, as we saw in Rwanda and elsewhere, had their neighbors turn on them and were deeply confused about what had happened, uh, deeply worried. I think anyone living in a township in South Africa feels insecure anyway. This was just uh, something else. In many instances, they couldn't go back because their houses had been immediately rented or given to someone else, along with all of the, their beds and their TVs and fridges or whatever else they had. So there was nothing uh, to go back uh, to. In some areas, the community leaders overtly said, if these people come back, we will kill them. And this has happened in a number of instances where people tried to go back, even if it was simply to get their stuff, to take it out. Uh, they were killed in Masapumalele, outside of Cape Town. The political leaders were being, there was an award ceremony, thanking them uh, for uh, trying to promote reintegration and an Ethiopian went back and then was killed by other community leaders or members of the community uh, while he was there on the same day. You know, so this is, this is what's uh, going on. However, in some places there was a possibility of return, uh, and this is in areas where the leadership did have sort of broader support um, and, and, uh, you know, and the, the violence hadn't happened, and people had just fled, and their stuff was protected, and they were able uh, to come back. We should say that the tensions are still uh, simmering very much. Since the, um, since the May attacks, something like a dozen foreigners have been targeted and killed uh, in, thing, in instances that are not simply normal, South Africa's normal criminal activity, instances of Somali women being sort of stabbed 65 times and not robbed, shopkeepers being shot and not robbed, these sorts of things uh, happening quite regularly. Uh, and you're, you're again, you're starting to see the political parties now realizing that they can win uh, votes at the local level by scapegoating foreigners. And, and this, oddly in the past, has not been a major election issue in the past elections. Uh, and I think South Africa is now realizing, you know, a la Le Pen and, and others, you know, that this, you can win a lot of votes by scapegoating foreigners and saying that uh, winning an election on a promise that you will finish the job that they started in May. And we've heard this a few times um, from local leaders. So where to from here? This is the speculative part. This is what can be done. Uh, up to this point, I think it's quite a depressing picture. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to be completely depressing. Um, but we don't know exactly what can be done. As I mentioned before, the government is in a, in a difficult uh, place. Uh, and that any sort of initiative that is seen as pro-migrant uh, is going to be very difficult uh, to take on. Jacob Zuma's support is a kind of populist, nationalistic support, uh, and that's what people are looking for. We do think that there are some things, however, that could be done that would help not just protect foreigners, but uh, future violence, particularly the potential of violence against non 
uh, foreign outsiders. The, the first would be any effort to promote accountability and to counter impunity. South Africa has arrested a few hundred of the people who were involved in the, the violence. I think 40 have uh, had their cases heard and been convicted. But most of these are sort of people who are out on the streets, members of the mobs. As far as we know, there's been no real investigation uh, from a forensic side into what happened, and none of the leaders have been arrested. So their kind of uh, foot soldiers have been uh, arrested, but the, the big fish remain in power, uh, often in local leadership uh, positions. Uh, so our, uh, obviously our next recommendation would be to try to find some way of isolating and removing those leaders from the community. That will be difficult, but you know, is obviously if you can show that someone is criminal, is something that needs to be done. Uh, I think the local government structure in South Africa does need broader reforms, not just around this, but it's clear that you're seeing massive disaffection and alienation from the political structures. The ANC, after it was elected in 1994, very quickly dismantled its uh, sort of local level structures uh, and became quite wary of too much participation uh, because I think it would, it would have pushed a very strong populist agenda, which they didn't want to take. Uh, and I think there's, there's probably a need now for the state to try to re-engage at that local uh, level. I think there is also something that political leaders can do, which is to try to shift the immigration policy and, and discourse. Um, I think there's a, a typo there. You know, but as I suggested before, for, for decades, or at least since 1994, the political leadership has often scapegoated foreigners. You see a kind of progressive cosmopolitanism among a certain sector, but the, the vast majority of politicians continue to see foreigners as a threat to South Africa. Uh, this despite the recognition that South Africa's future will depend on bringing foreigners in to fill highly skilled positions to provide needed labor, semi-skilled labor. So I think there is a need there to shift uh, the discourse. And lastly, some sort of regular monitoring and ten of, of tensions uh, and early interventions. About two years ago, a few of us went to the Human Rights Commission and others saying, we're worried about the rise of this violence. It seems to be happening. They said, look, we don't have time this year to investigate this or to look into it. Uh, and I think you know, something could have been done a long time ago around this. Foreigners have not been on the political agenda. There's, you're not going to win any political points by trying to help foreigners. But I think South Africa has seen that you can lose a lot um, by not trying to protect them. And so we're, we're trying to suggest that there is a way forward in, in monitoring this, being on the ground, uh, and paying attention, and doing something about it. All right, that's where I'll stop. Thank you all for your uh, attention. I look forward to the comments and <laughs> questions. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Steve, do you want to go first? Uh, might as well. Uh, Lauren, thank you very much. That was an extremely interesting and comprehensive uh, uh, presentation and study. Uh, I, I must say I'm, I'm, I'm really taken by your findings and, and some of the things. Uh, Whitney and I are, are here probably primarily because we spend a lot of time in South Africa <laughs> as opposed to being experts on urbanization or immigrant migrant issues. Uh, certainly for anyone in the United States, uh, at least uh, the underlying tensions in society about uh, migrant uh, issues is understood here. I mean, that's uh, that's an issue in our own past, uh, just past election campaign that was that was quite hot. It's one that that neither Republicans nor Democrats know quite how to approach, and for the most part are leaving alone because they don't know the answers. Um, uh, I'm not sure I have a lot of insight to uh, uh, to uh, to bring to this. Uh, uh, I was living and working in South Africa intensely through the 70s and 80s, um, and. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm happy that you brought in the historical context of this because that is extremely important for Americans and other outsiders to understand uh, that the, the patterns of violence uh, through the uh, state of emergency uh, and the, uh, the campaign to make the townships ungovernable, uh, which was a political campaign, of course, through the, the mid-1980s, uh, was very similar to this. The kinds of violence was perpetrated uh, with, with uh, burnings and, and beatings of, of uh, local uh, township officials who were seen as scapegoats of, uh, of uh, unpopular apartheid uh, white regime. And, uh, and uh, 
uh, the violence was perpetrated on them. Um, and, and it's interesting that, as you say, that the, that, that the patterns of violence have been very similar, both in the places that took place as well as the type of violence, although, of course, the scope is nowhere near the same. Um, I, um, I was recently, I, last year I was in South Africa three different times and I got the chance to spend some time in Kayalicha and Crossroads in Alexandria, and, and even in the, uh, I guess you'd call it a sub-township of Harare in, uh, in Kayalicha, which is all you need to know about it. It's all Mozambicans. Um, and I certainly saw, I wasn't looking at, uh, at, uh, at uh, violence against foreigners per se, but I certainly saw the, the divisions that you uh, have underlined in, in terms of local leadership and, uh, and the competitions between uh, political groupings. I mean, the delivery of services, including uh, medical clinics, uh, aid uh, assistance for HIV AIDS programs, uh, development zones, and et cetera, are all patterned after who, whether it's ANC or uh, Nkata Control or, you know, whichever party, uh, all of those goodies go to the area that's controlled by, uh, by the party who has, has the upper hand in that particular township area. Uh, and and I, uh, if, if I understood correctly, uh, the, the, again, those were where the, the patterns of violence really occurred, not in the, not in the more heterogeneous uh, uh, townships where there was uh, less sort of dictatorial control. Um, the uh, and it's also important to, to remember, and again, most Americans might not understand that the townships in South Africa were originally basically set up uh, as kind of uh, ethnic enclaves. As uh, uh, in, in a huge township like Soweto, for instance, although all ethnicities were represented there, there was a predominantly Zulu area, predominantly Kosa area, predominantly Sutu area, and etc. And, of course, the migrant uh, labor system, which set up the uh, uh, hostels and et cetera, were, were always explosive areas with, uh, with single men who were there for months at a time on contracts, uh, all one ethnicity leave, living in the same uh, uh, hostel, and that hostel might be located in another ethnic area. And so there was, there was always explosive violence around there, uh, uh, sometimes rioting and, and serious uh, 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 group violence, uh, but but constant uh, uh, attacking of uh, uh, or, or tensions and violence between residents, rapes, and, and things of this nature. Um, uh, so uh, I'm really resonating to the report, uh, but as you sort of ended, uh, I, I'm, I'm left very, very pessimistic, and uh, uh, you, you, you were pretty depressing, I'm sorry, uh, uh, because it's hard to see where it's going to go, because I, uh, your recommendations are fine recommendations, but, uh, but my, my, the question I'm left with is recommendations to who? I mean, how, how are they going to be implemented? Uh, I think back, for instance, in your recommendation about increased conflict uh, resolution uh, um, uh, work in the townships and, and in these areas. I, I think back to the days, uh, uh, the, uh, the height of apartheid in the 80s, and Whitney would remember this too, when we had a, a number of uh, um, um, conflict resolution, reconciliation kind of programs being run by the Quakers, being run by Javier Van de Merver, uh, Cape Town, and others uh, that had quite, quite a bit of success. And, and I don't see where those are these days. Now, I might not just be familiar enough with the territory as I was in those days, uh, uh, but that kind of uh, reconciliation and conflict resolution, conflict transformation work, a kind of thing that I'm involved in very intimately in other parts of Africa and Burundi and Congo and Liberia. Uh, could could have an amazing effect, but how do you get that done? How do you get people to accept the need for it? Uh, where's government's role in in implementing these uh, these uh, uh, recommendations? So so that's the question I'm left with, and 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 why I, I, I am depressed at the end of it because uh, because I know exactly what you're saying in term with uh, with the election coming up with uh, uh, with uh, uh, the. Uh, 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 foreigners uh, and xenophobia having become a political point that is actually an advantage to the uh, political candidates, candidates uh, if they play off of that. Uh, there's very little likelihood in the short term, anyway, that uh, that government will be playing a positive role in this. Uh, so, so I'd like to hear maybe a little bit more from you on how that might be put into place. Uh, uh, but those are my thoughts. Uh, with <laughs> Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. And um, uh, let me just underscore uh, Steve's comments on, on, on how interesting uh, 
your report is, which I've read, by the way, and uh, uh, found it very, uh, very important, I think, and really uh, focusing on, on, a, on a critical issue. Let me just um, respond to uh, a couple of points uh, that you've made and that uh, Steve made as well. First, um, as, as Steve say, I you know don't pretend to be an expert in migration or urbanization, but yes, I've been involved in South Africa for for some time. I've been visiting regularly and, and can make some comments from what I've seen over time. Um, Lauren, I, th I, I think you were right to point out that that there's no single factor explanation here. No question about it. You know, why May 2008 as versus May 2007? And I think it sort of suggests that, that it can um, happen again. But, but, but clearly, um, so, some, some of the several enabling factors that, that, that you mentioned sort of resonated with me more than others. There's one example in your report that, that, that I found very interesting and where you said that, um, you know, one of the causal factors was, you know, in your interviews and uh, a respondent said, well, foreigners came and they took RDP houses. Now, RDP houses, for, for those, as I understood it, comes from the Reconstruction and Development Program, which was the program that the ANC put forward at the time of transition, where they said, we're going to build, I, I can't quite remember, 500,000, a million houses, we're going to create a million jobs, and we're going to electrify a million homes. In other words, they put forward what development was going to be like and what the ANC was going to be measured against for the people. And I thought that was an extremely important development. And the fact that somebody can jump the queue and get into one of these houses suggests that local institutions are not working. Local government is not working. It's corrupt. It's inefficient. It, there's, there's a big problem there. Um, so, I, so I think that is critical. Another critical factor, xenophobia, you know, that's certainly how it's being expressed. At the same time, there's, it, I've always been struck by South Africa about how jealous South Africans are about their national sovereignty, whether it is an, an, a national party government, an ANC government. South Africans love South Africa, and uh, they're very jealous about it. And, you know, this is, this is a factor, and, and so it can be pushed to an extreme, which, which becomes um, xenophobia. I was struck, again, doing, doing a little bit of research. Um, you, you, you mentioned some aspects of the government's response. Um, I, I, I dug up a statement from uh, Tabo and Becky uh, m from Monday, May 19th, two, 2008. You know, where I think he's pretty strong in, in condemning. He says, South Africa's transition to democracy was one of the world's most iconic testimonies of tolerance and peaceful coexistence. The recent intensified spates of perceived xenophobic attacks on foreign nationals expressed through acts of intense violence and inhumanity are a threat to our historical achievements as a nation. We cannot forget the hospitality that was given to South Africans who were in exile in the neighboring countries and the rest of the continent during the days of apartheid. And he goes on. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, when you compare this statement and this response against some other major issues that they didn't respond to, such as HIV AIDS, such as Zimbabwe, I think it really shows that the government is, in fact, very, very concerned. Now, um, where do we um, go from here? Because I think that really is the uh, critical um, issue. Your comment... And, and Steve uh, alluded it, to it as well, uh, that parties win votes by scapegoating foreigners. There's no question that if this becomes part of the ANC platform, part of COPE's platform, part of other political parties' platforms, South Africa is headed in an extremely uh, dangerous direction. Um, I don't see it like that. And to go back to what I came away with uh, from, from watching South Africa's extraordinary transition from um, apartheid to democracy, a, a, a four-year, five-year transition. <clears throat> One of the distinguishing factors of that transition was, was just how South Africans of, of all colors, all backgrounds, all income uh, brackets came together at all different levels. 
at that time in early 1990s, you had education forums. You had education forums at the national level, provincial level, the community level. You had health forums. You had uh, infrastructure forums, and on and on. And I think that really this is this is where the government needs to go and where the political parties need to go to address these people or to address these issues so that you can get the local leadership in place who will respond to these problems. I was interested in your distinction between good community leaders and bad local leaders. How do we get those good community leaders to become good local leaders? Uh, I think it's possible. I think um, South Africa certainly has the capability to respond, but I think this is where um, your organizations and, and others like you um, really have to shape the debate and, and hold the leadership accountable. And as we move, as South Africa moves into this electoral season, uh, this clearly, I think, uh, needs to be one of the issues that is put on the uh, agenda. So let me leave it there. Thank you. Warren, would you like to take up? A couple of points. I'd rather hear from the audience. I don't. I mean, I think that the question of who is going to do this is is really the the big one, and I don't have any answers. I think the government can, NGOs should, obviously, if if they can get the support um, to do so. I think the statement that you read from Mbeki is uh, was very strong, and everyone condemned it immediately. But those are the sorts of statements that people say. Look, he doesn't get <laughs> our issues. He loves foreigners. Right, uh, he's you know he rec and they, this is part of what um, the sense of uh, with Zuma coming in, he wouldn't make that sort of statement. He wouldn't say we need we need to be cosmopolitan and tolerant. He would say South Africa must come first. At least that's the impression uh, among population. That statement was something that was repeated to us over and over to say just how out of touch Mbeki is. First, he didn't recognize AIDS. Then he didn't recognize all these other things, and now he thinks that foreigners are good for us. Right? I mean, and this is, I think that's the sort of popular discourse uh, on the street. Uh, and I think the, the new leadership is very scared of, of following yeah, in his footsteps. So. Okay, we have, a we have lots of questions. We have a question in the very back. I, I see one hand here and two hands over here. Okay. Oh. Uh, my name is Maneli Situbas. I'm uh, with the South African Broadcasting Corporation. Um, I agree that uh, uh, the presentation uh, was uh, impressive, but uh, I just have uh, one or two questions. I don't know whether some of the issues uh, which um, I think are very much part of this, uh, you can call it xenophobic, uh, are being left deliberately because I haven't heard any NGO in South Africa or any other party mentioning it. Um, the issue of uh, uh, white farmers and white businesses who are hiring these people from abroad knowing that they don't have papers, they are there illegally, uh, they can simply not pay them. Uh, they can simply uh, sometimes just give them a, a loaf of bread and a two-liter Coke as a payment, uh, avoiding to hire South Africans, making a silly argument which has been made even here in America that uh, these are jobs which South Africans do not want to do, uh, which is nonsense. I mean, this is one of the things that is uh, uh, leading to this violence against foreigners. Um, uh, people from Somalia, from the DRC, and so on, they come to South Africa without even a penny. And suddenly they have businesses. And nobody asks where do they get capital to start these businesses. It is white businesses who are complementing their losses in the towns, in towns, in cities. They open these businesses in, in, in the townships and hire these people, uh, even not hiring South Africans, uh, you know, who would be unionized and you know, want to uh, get, uh, you know, their rights in terms of um, uh, living wages, uh, you know, um, medical aids or health insurances and so on. They hire these people knowing that uh, they might not pay them. They have nowhere to complain uh, because they, they are there illegally in the first place. These things have not been highlighted, and it is part of the problem in South Africa. I was happy when... Um, 
blessed. This matter is a, a, become a global phenomenon, if it is not already, when it started here, because most of the NGOs, again, in South Africa and other people, they make it as a South African problem. And when you say that one of the issues that, uh, or one of the solutions, is that we must encourage South African companies and even the government to invest in these companies, I mean in these countries. You can't be one country with his pro which is prospering in the island of poverty. People will come there. It's a problem here in America. Most of the people who bring in drugs here, yeah, I mean, they come from countries like Mexico. Some of these drugs doesn't originate here in America. Uh, and so th that is a problem. And in terms of this uh, South African seeing outsiders as a threat, I mean, you can look all the drugs that have been confiscated by police since last year until even the end of January. They come from outside. Uh, South African Airways crew were arrested in London very recently uh, with drug consignments. The mastermind was a Nigerian. So there is a legitimate, you know, concern that these outsiders are bringing all these kind of uh, illegal things and criminality inside the country. Some of the stolen guns in South Africa are not originating from South Africa, from countries like DRC, Angola, those conflict countries. So I just want to hear your comment on this thing, whether is it deliberately that you don't highlight these matters, or perhaps you haven't done thorough research uh, on these matters. And I've been concerned also about uh, the, the solutions you propose to the government. Uh, it looked like you highlight matters, and quite truly, I mean, legitimate issues that you raise. But I haven't heard properly the solutions. What do you think the solutions are? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Should I respond? Yeah, well, I think you should okay. respond. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I think it, it does help to highlight some of the, the discourse that is in South Africa, which I didn't speak about. I mean, obviously, long term solutions have to do with making sure everyone has a job and that South Africa is not the most unequal country in the world or close to it. Uh, those are broader macroeconomic uh, and policy decisions, but as we suggested, those kind of things don't explain why the violence happened in certain places, because it wasn't always the poorest, it wasn't always those who had lost the jobs that attacked them. And so we didn't think that those were the, the sort of the critical ones. In terms of generally about foreigners stealing jobs, Obviously, there is competition. We talked to employers who said, look, why would we hire a South African who will come to work on the first day and read us the Labor Act and tell us about their rights uh, when we could hire a foreigner? But I think the solution is obviously not to keep foreigners out, which is an impossibility as the, South Af as the US and every other country has it's noticed, but to do what the AFL-CIO and others have done, to say, let's include foreigners in our advocacy campaigns and make sure that when they work, they're also paid decent wages uh, and that has not been the approach of South African civil society, which continues to say we just need to keep foreigners out. And so I think that, that we need to shift the, the discourse in there. And in terms of crime, the, you're right. Uh, international crim criminal syndicates are a problem. But if you look at the arrest statistics and the conviction statistics, 98% of crime in South Africa is done by South Africans. They've got a long history of urban violence and crime that didn't need to be, uh, they don't need to be shown by anyone how to do it. You know, so it's, it's, Yes, there are foreign criminals, but most of the, the crime is coming from within uh, South Africa. You know, so it's, it's not, we shouldn't be looking at, at migration control as a form of crime prevention. I mean, that's, that's not going to, uh, to work. But I think you're, you're right, there needs to be a broader discussion and to recognize that there are very real political uh, sensibilities that are, uh, need to be, a, in terms of popular opinion, in terms of what, what leaders can do in, in taking these, uh, these issues forward. Okay, I have. Oh, okay, since you're right there, right, we'll take the woman right there, and then we'll come over to the side. Oh, um, it is a fascinating report, and I think I heard it briefed. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Patricia okay. Kiefer from the American Federation of Teachers, and I just returned from living and working for 19 years in South Africa during this whole process, and left South Africa about two months after the um, disturbances in May. My question really is one that I, I think that's more addressed to Whitney, which has to do with how this bodes for, for future political leadership in South Africa. I, um, 
I would ad also want to address my friend here because I don't think what you talked about is simply a racial context of, of, perm of being perpetuated by white businesses. In my, last, in my work for the last seven years, I've worked with organized teachers in both Zimbabwe and South Africa. And in the last two years, have seen a very aggressive action on behalf of the South Africa government to recruit Zimbabwe teachers in math and science, bring them to South Africa, place them in schools, much to the irritation of South African unions because the South Afri this government, the ANC government, is doing this on contractual hires, so they do not have to pay the negotiated settlements that they have with the teacher unions in South Africa. So I think there's complicity by your government in this matter, and I don't think it only exists in the education sector. Um, but it really is one, the, the, the message you read from Tabo Mabeki was one that I remember being, um, being reported. It seemed though in those days that there was almost a deafening silence, not unlike what happened here after Katrina. Um, I don't think, for example, this type of protest action is uh, something that one can say is unique to South Africa. This is the way South Africans protest. I mean, this is the way the French protest. This, this is the way Americans engaged in urban action in Katrina. Um, it is more, I think, and I think you would agree from your profession, endemic of what happens in a disadvantaged and a desperate population. Um, and as I recall, and I might be wrong about this, I think it was Geraldine Fraser Malachetti who was the first cabinet minister to venture out into Alexandra as one of the townships to do site visits. But that seemed to take days as well. Um, and so taken with everything that you all know about South Africa, having studied and exposed to this transition now for 20 years, where is the leadership of this country going to deal with the lack of social cohesion? Um, and how do we understand it as we look at what our relationships are with South Africa, what we would still like to see its role be in the region, um, and whether it's a Mabeki government or a Zuma government, um, what are the positive signs and what are the things that we can do to, uh, to support those forces, whether they're community-based organizations or um, various ways in which we deal diplomatically and development-wise with South Africa in the next couple of years. Whitney, I think your name was mentioned. Okay, modest question, Pat. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though. I think you uh, just, you know, bring up some, some very critical um, issues. Um, number one, um, on the response, look, statements are statements. I think it's, it is interesting, though, that they did deploy the military, and it just shows, again, the government's awareness and sensitivity, given the fact, as, as, as Lauren pointed out, the number of deaths during this two-week period was no greater than any other two-week period. But the fact that it was couched in this xenophobia just touched a nerve in government that I think uh, was quite, um, quite, quite sensitive. Um, and, you know, I don't know, you know, was it enough? Probably not. It's probably never enough. It hasn't happened since, I, which is encouraging. But I think there's anxiety that it, that it will happen again. And, and the way to minimize that, uh, I think, goes to the heart of your question, you know, where's leadership going and what are the positive signs? From my point of view, I think it's a tremendously positive sign that there's another political party, that, that there was a faction that has broken away from the ANC that is prepared to challenge the ANC in a certain way that, that none of the other political parties uh, have been able to do. And I think that, that raises um, uh, important opportunities. Um, you know, we, we talk about Jacob Zuma a lot, the perceived next president. Um, you know, what's his policy going to be on this? 
is one question. What's his economic policy going to be? Is Trevor Manuel going to be there? So there are a lot of question marks, but certainly in Zuma's movements through Washington and, and conversations we've had with them, they, they go to great lengths to ensure us that there will be continuity of economic policy, which hopefully, you know, augurs the fact that that maybe they do get it. It's not just Zuma, it's people around him. Maybe they do get it and, and understand the need to um, address this. Um, again, what are the positive signs? Well, I think one of the positive signs is that this report has been written and the fact that you know NGOs uh, such as Lawrence Center for De Democracy and Enterprise and, and others are addressing this. Clearly, it needs to be taken uh, to a higher level much more quickly. And I think engaging uh, COSATU and the labor unions in this discussion directly is quite important to try to develop some kind of... Um, uh, framework for dealing with these issues because as the gentleman from the SABC points out this is not just South Africa the United States France many governments deal with migration issues xenophobia racism and uh, it is up to all sectors of government and 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 the state to respond if it's going to be dealt with and if there isn't that kind of broad response then uh, it is quite unsettling I think we'll go. Uh, may, may I? Uh, sure. Okay. Just add a note there. Uh, I just think that Pat has asked the right question, and it goes back a little bit to the question that I asked too, and that, that is, where's the leadership in this? And I think the leadership has to be at the national level. Uh, I don't have the answer to the question. Uh, uh, we, we've heard from Lauren, and we all know that uh, there's been a failure of leadership at the local level, at the township level. Uh, uh, um, and uh, it, sometimes it's been complicit, sometimes it is not, sometimes it's been positive, sometimes it's not. But those kinds of divisions that, that I highlighted and that Lauren highlighted uh, at, the, uh, at the local levels uh, between parties, between different interest groups, uh, and et cetera, uh, will not be solved there. They'll only be solved by national leadership. Um, and, and the answer may be, uh, and here's where what Whitney picks up as one of the positives, and that is the kind of attention that's being paid to this issue now by NGOs, uh, and Lauren's report and other things. And, and I, I was just there again in November and in July and August since this violence took place, and it certainly is a, 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 a point of discussion broadly in the community about what to do about this. Um, uh, there needs to be some kind of national dialogue on this. I, I think back, and, and we all should think back to the, 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 the famously raucous but, uh, but uh, creative period of CODESA, uh, uh, 92, 93, 94, leading up to the elections in 94, where all South Africans came together and looked at the constitutional questions and looked at these issues in this transition. Uh, something like this needs to happen again, I think. Uh, you're not going to uh, you're not going to engage the government alone, particularly in the pre-election period on this, but uh, but maybe in the post-election period the government can take this lead and, and, and call for a national dialogue or a national convention uh, on, on these kinds of issues. But the leadership really needs to come from the top very strongly. Okay, we will now go back to the floor. We'll go to this gentleman. I, I see two more hands on this side, and I just saw a new hand here. I, we're we're going to be trying to get everybody in. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Dan O'Flaherty with the U.S. South Africa Business Council with the Corporate Council on Africa. And Mr. Landau, thank you for a very interesting uh, uh, report and presentation. Uh, I have a question, a uh, two-part question. First of all, about the provenance of the outburst. Uh, urban explosions in developing countries are not unique, most famous being the Bogotazo in, in uh, Bogota, Colombia in the late 1940s, which was a sort of spontaneous uh, eruption of tremendous violence that, that then abated. Uh, now, apparently, this one has also abated. Uh, you say 12 deaths since May of, of 2008. That's 10 months of relative calm. Um, so one, one, one question that arises is what are the variables that, that, that uh, if you, and I'm apologize, I was, I was late, so I'm not, you may have addressed this already, but what are the variables that govern the level of violence or the, the outbursts of this sort? Um, now, secondly, um, you know, Whitney, you're right about uh, uh, continuity of macroeconomic policies, but we are in a new world now, and uh, South Africa is not going to escape the global recession. Uh, so the question arises, what impact will a, an economic downturn have on the probability of repeated uh, uh, occasions of this? Thank you. 
I, I think maybe we'll go ahead and, and take the gentleman in the back and we'll have two questions to, and then we'll come back up and then I'm going to go just so you know after we have responses we'll go here and then over here uh, thank you and a fascinating talk my name is Rich Fryman from the Wilson Center I was wondering if you talk a little bit more about immediate causes um, why exactly May 11th um, was the violence simultaneous across the different areas or did it start in one area and spread um, what was the role of the media in, in shaping this a at the time? Uh, finally, I guess just a, a, a quick comment on, on solutions. This does have a very long history. Um, what, what struck me as you were doing your presentation was, was thinking about uh, burnings, taking of stuff, lynchings, violence in the United States, in the West Coast cities of uh, Wyoming, uh, Oregon, Washington, California, 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. Um, it's not just current. This has been going on for quite some time. Uh, looking across advanced industrial countries, the solutions seem to be uh, several. Either you have massive exclusion and deportation of the foreign population, either forced or through the threat of fear. Uh, you deploy out of area military or the police to try and solve the problem. Uh, major political parties will embrace foreign scapegoating until they become concerned that they're losing control of the issue, either to each other or to fringe parties. Uh, relying on popular backlash in favor of foreigners is much less common. Uh, it, it happens in rare instances. And just to reinforce the point that Steve made, uh, what has to happen is leadership from the top. Thank you. Okay. Let me try to respond quickly. I mean, these are all huge discussions, obviously. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the specific variables, I think that what we saw was, <clears throat> I mean, it was the middle of winter, it's cold, price of, of electricity, the price of food and everything had at that point just skyrocketed. Even transport to get to work had doubled in the last few months as a result of fuel prices. So I think those tensions uh, set the stage for it. And then to, to build on the point about it being an economic crisis, this is part of what is worrying. A lot of, I mean, unemployment is already pretty extraordinary in South Africa likely to get worse uh, in, the, in the months ahead. And the, the specific triggers were uh, political opportunism. I mean, people recognizing that they could, in one instance, in, in Alex, it was in preparation for this year's election, in which the hostels, uh, the, the leaders of the hostel wanted to clear an area of foreigners who were presumed to be ANC supporters so that they could make sure to win uh, that district. Other places, it was more sort of parochial interests. But part of our concern then is that those same incentives, you have the, the economic crisis is getting worse and the inequality is probably going to get worse and then you provide a whole new range of, of uh, political incentives with the, new, with the election and then with all of the uh, restructuring that's likely to happen uh, afterwards. In terms of, of the, the kind of geography of the, of the violence, uh, there had been attacks, actually escalating attacks before Alexandra in the weeks, uh, just in the weeks before outside of Pretoria, uh, which had, had gotten very little response. Uh, in one instance, the, the response had actually been to uh, arrest the people who had been displaced and deport them. This was, almost, you know, uh, leading to this idea that, that these people really have no rights. Uh, I think part of why Alex touched it off was precisely because it, it was so close to Johannesburg. It has a, um, a sort of reputation. It's a politically symbolic uh, spot. It was a very strong uh, point of resistance in the 80s and had been held up as a kind of place that had managed uh, to overcome that legacy and, and was a, a space of tolerance. And then specifically because Winnie Mandela went there almost immediately. And if you see this as symbolic violence of people's disaffection with the government, uh, and now you kill a few foreigners and you get Winnie Mandela to come. Someone pays attention, comes and promises you houses, comes and promises you that the government cares and is going to give you jobs. Uh, I think that that sends a powerful message that this is a way to get the attention of the national leadership that's been ignoring you or seems to have been ignoring you for the last 15 years. Uh, and I think that's part of what kicked it off. The media in the past has had a, a fairly negative role in spreading stereotypes. In this instance, I think they just reported what was going on for the most part. And I think many of the journalists were shocked also at the degree of the violence. Uh, so it was really just a sort of demonstration effect that people saw what was happening, and they also saw that they could get away with it and that they could get attention uh, for it, and that helped uh, spread it around the country. Okay, 
you both feel your questions are answered? <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to go here next, then over here, and then I see a, another person has put a hand up over here. Okay. Cecily Brewer with the International Housing Coalition. And my question is just, you've touched on it a bit about urbanization and what factors about urbanization have played into this. And then from the solution side, you know, what, looking at urbanization as maybe a problem and an opportunity, what can be done to, you know, improve that side of the situation? And why don't we then also give the question over here? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Nozi Pumbandra from uh, Umlamba Foundation based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, my first uh, is just a comment. Just looking at the uh, cholera outbreak in Zimbabwe and the impact that is actually having in uh, the province of in Limpopo, has the government um, I know that we're in a bit of a vacuum right now, but has there been any, any indication of this, uh, how this will be called in terms of it being another stimulant to further violence? Because as we know, a lot of people have been dying off because of the cholera, and the general sentiment is that the Zimbabweans are bringing the cholera, which is killing our people. So, I mean, I, have, I feel that this is something that really needs to be looked at. Um, secondly, just another comment on the... If I quote, if I'm quoting correctly, South Africans and the jealousy of their national sovereignty. Um, I just think that the mere fact that black South Africans had to experience apartheid speaks volumes to that statement. And that would explain um, why uh, South Africans have such an ownership of their place of birth. Perhaps you could get, uh, shed a bit more light on what exactly you meant by that. And then um, lastly, I just feel that um, South Africans in general ha are very ignorant about not only Africa, but the rest of the world in general. And I think as a way going forward, we need to educate South Africans about this because evidently, and it is true, that South Africa is an economic center, not only in the region, in the continent, and therefore there will always be an influx of Africans coming um, into South Africa. But the struggle um, that led to the liberation of South Africans was fought on many African on the, on the lands of many African countries. So there, there is a sense of um, um, gratitude and a sense of, you know, that South Africans do have to feel towards other Africans, but that sense doesn't permeate all the way to the bottom. It's sort of stuck at the national level by those people who were in exile and um, people in the normal townships don't understand that. So there is a need to sort of let the education systems um, penetrate and get South Africans to better understand relations with other Africans and the rest of the world as well. I mean, what happened in Kenya just a few months before the xenophobic outbreak in South Africa should have been used as um, a very clear image of the way in which South Africa does not want to go. And then I just do want to apologize. I have not seen your report, so my last comment might be completely off the mark. But um, I feel that you've made a lot of allegations in your um, presentation that I would be very keen to read your report to find out if you have um, backing um, evidence for that. For example, that there's a clear collaboration between local leaders. Are you now um, police? and members of chambers of commerce, when you say local leaders, are you saying that the, the municipal councils that sit at the local level of government are the ones that are pointing out um, of foreigners? Because if this is, is a major allegation, it has to be you know, put out there and have to, has to be dealt with if that is the case. And also, Jeffville, um, I don't know, is, this, is it just a coincidence that Jeff Khadeb is one of the ministers in South Africa and that place, and this guy's name is um, Jeff Khadebe. I, I live in Pretoria and I have lived there for the last decade or so. I've never heard of the place. So I'll read your report and maybe you'll give more insight. Thank you. There are a lot of questions here. So I think we should take these and then we'll come back. Okay. Um, I, well, I would, maybe we can continue to talk. I think a lot of these, uh, again, are huge questions. The first question about what, what about urbanization? I mean, I think what you, what you see in South Africa is it's, <laughs> This is a, a sort of complicated issue, I think, which I'll try to grapple with. One is that you have very rapid growth in these informal settlements uh, over the last few years. The South African housing policy that they heard about has not been dedicated to provide those people housing in the places that they want to live. You have the housing being provided in, in the, either the home or in the townships that are far away and not um, proximate, uh, and you have rapid relocations of those people out of those areas. Uh, so there tend to be people who are still in shacks. Uh, 
you don't have much planning uh, for them. Uh, the, the political structures continue to see urbanization as a threat. I think this is a, a legacy of um, colonial and apartheid era planning in which there's a very strong kind of anti-urban, anti-poor uh, kind of mentality within city planning. Uh, you know, and so that these people have not come in. You also, because it is such a transient population, there are not stable leadership structures and they are not engaged regularly in a, with uh, sort of discussions. You know, that it, it's, a, it's a hostile place, very fragmented, and I think that allows it to become very prone uh, to violence. Uh, you know, that there's, there isn't a sort of stable institutions. You don't have churches, you don't have community centers, you don't even have families in many instances that stabilize the population. So it's a, uh, it's a, it, there's dangerous little pockets all over the place. Uh, in terms of cholera, I mean, I think you're, you're right in that this is being held up as, look, what's happening with the Zimbabweans. Again, result of a poor response to the Zimbabwean migration rather than the Zimbabweans per se. I mean, the local leadership in Messina, for example, has stopped the UNHCR and others from building tents and sanitation systems for the, the thousands of Zimbabweans who are there because they're afraid that this will attract more. So as a result, they're reaping the very poor rewards for you know, trying to resist uh, uh, a more progressive uh, response. I do think, echoing what you've said and what others have said, there is a need to have a real national discussion around what it means to live in a multicultural, multinational society, which is something I think South Africa started in the mid-90s and didn't continue. Uh, they are in a difficult place of trying to create a nation out of a very diverse domestic population in a kind of globalized era, you know, when, you know, which is not something that most countries have ever had to do, you know, and I think that there is, it's difficult, and there's going to have to be a discussion about where that, um, that goes. In terms of your evidence of the local leaders, they admitted that they were doing this. We went and talked to them, and they told us proudly uh, that they took a role in identifying foreigners and helping to get them out of the communities. Didn't take us very long to figure this out. Um, you know, and people would, as a, there's this quote from the person in Alex, saying, look, they were there all the way with the gangs, the Chamber of Commerce uh, working with the police, going from house to house and identifying people, removing them from their houses. Uh, it's a, it is in the report. We haven't named all of the names uh, to try to protect our, our respondents, but a police investigation should, if they were serious about it, would find these things out uh, very quickly. Here. Thank you. Uh, Daryl Martiris with the USAID mission in Pretoria. A um, couple of questions. From your presentation, I didn't get the impression that um, areas with large concentrations of mining or agricultural migrants were targeted. Uh, could you verify that? And if true, what, what do you think the reasons were? And uh, the second is really a comment. Do you think there's a role for the churches in addressing this problem? I understand that uh, certain churches, like the Zionist church, have huge memberships in South Africa. Yeah, I mean, you're right that the, the agricultural areas were not, you didn't see much violence uh, or the mining areas. Uh, to some extent, it's, mining has become less and less a foreign issue than it, it was in the past because of the unions and the labor laws. The agricultural areas, I think you have a, a fragment, I mean, the population is quite dispersed in those, you don't have this sort of dense townships. And this was dis uh, a distinctly a sort of urban phenomenon emerging out of struggles for control over those areas. In a lot of the mining areas where there is a, a sort of more urban kind of thing, the political leadership that's there is in power. Right? The, there's not a debate. You know, it's either ANC or IFP. You don't have that conflict. Whereas in the townships, you have these sort of heterogeneous groups struggling uh, for authority, and I think that's part of uh, what was um, behind it. And in terms of their churches, I think they could have a very powerful role. You're seeing the Central Methodist Church in Johannesburg, for example, trying to do a lot to reach out to the Zimbabweans. He's now being sued by his neighbors for hosting Zimbabweans at the church. Uh, he's lost a lot of his constituents, if that's what you call church members. Um, I'm not a Parishioners. church caller. Parishioners. Parishioners. Yes. Um, uh, you know, th because they also don't like the idea that the church is being taken over, they see it as, as Zimbabweans. But I think that we have to work with whatever institutions uh, 
that we can. And there are definitely, Desmond Tutu has been a strong voice against this, and others can be persuaded. Um, you know, and and that, that's a way of reaching people with something that is a legitimate institution for many. I, um, I, I don't, I, since we've run through the questions, I don't want to prolong this too much longer, but I, I want to push on a couple of points. I apologize because I really, I know virtually nothing about South Africa. I spent all of a week there, which means I know I'm more confused than had I never gone there. Um, and like most, you know, m most humans, I, I try to domesticate the unfamiliar by filtering it through the familiar. So when I listen to you speak, there are a couple of points which strike me as uh, not being totally indigenous to South Africa. And um, the first observation I would make is whenever I hear conversations about South Africa, they strike me as very s similar conversations about a place I know very well, Russia, which is, it's big, people are, feel ownership of the country, and they want to talk about the, their country in its own terms, and they really don't bring in the outside world. And, and the discussions take place almost as if, in the Russian case, Russia exists in a vacuum, or South Africa exists in a vacuum. and, and uh, I may be totally off base on this, but I found in this discussion um, a couple of entry, interesting entry points for comparison which, which didn't come up. The first was a couple, Lauren, you mentioned in your report that you know, where the dog didn't bark. And one of the places, the kinds of places where the dog didn't bark were actually the places that were more heterogeneous. Uh, where there wasn't a simple divide, but there was a multiplicity of divides within the community. And that seems to be a very interesting point, and a point that resonates in a broader context. So I wonder if you could talk about that. And, and the second point, uh, and why I mentioned Russia, we've done a lot of work in Russia and in Ukraine on these issues. And, and the question of the presence of foreigners is a global challenge. We just had, you know, you pick up the newspaper this week in Washington or turn on the TV, you have police officials trying to meet arrest quotas in Baltimore going down the 7-Eleven looking for Hispanics so they can find people to arrest and meet quotas. Or that's what the allegation is. Um, there's been an increase of violence against foreigners in both Russia and Ukraine often with the complicity of local police officials, often police officials viewing foreigners as sort of walking ATM machines that you can rip them off without worrying about it, uh, but also because police wanting to build ties to local communities understand that foreigners are disliked, therefore if we beat up on the foreigners, our prestige will increase. But there's one fundamental difference between Russia and Ukraine. Russia doesn't feel as if it needs to be integrated anywhere. Uh, Russia is Russia. We play by our own rules. We tried to play by your rules. It made our country a mess. We're going back. We're playing by our rules. Ukraine, Ukrainian national leaders want Ukraine to be in NATO. They want Ukraine to be in Europe. And if you're going to be in NATO and you're going to be in Europe, you can't have people beaten up walking down the street because they look different. And what that means is, unlike Russia, actually the Ukrainian government is looking for ways to try to train the police, try to talk about these issues, try to develop an educational curriculum, not because they don't, anybody particularly cares for foreigners, but because it looks bad when you're applying to NATO uh, to have people who look like a lot of NATO soldiers beaten up when they're walking down the streets. So this whole question of how South Africa, what, this is a long way of getting around the question, how South Africa is embedded into a global context, how much does the outside world matter to South Africa seems to me to have a lot to do with how South Africans are going to respond and where the entry points are to, to opening up a different discussion. And if, if South Africa really is, if, 
a little bit like Russia, that we exist in our own world and we think about ourselves in that world, not in the larger world, then there are fewer points of sort of touching it. Thank you for that. And I think there is a lot that South Africa and I could learn from looking at what's happened elsewhere. You may have different views about where South Africa sees itself in the world. I think Mbeki definitely saw himself in the world, and that's part of what people disliked about him, is that he saw South Africa within a, a global and certainly a regional context. And there was a kind of part of the support for Zuma is that we need to look more at South Africans first, and that we need someone who's really concerned with addressing our needs, all of the disadvantages that came from apartheid. So I think some of those avenues are closing, um, you know, about a kind of more cosmopolitan South Africa. But we, we and hopefully with the support of everyone else, we'll, we'll continue to look for those avenues and to suggest that South Africa's future really does depend on its position in the region uh, and, and elsewhere. And there are Chinese, there's Indians also coming and they, these people must be protected if South Africa is going to succeed and retain its, its powerful sort of moral and economic position. Uh, and hopefully they'll listen to our arguments. But at this point, as you can see, my, my faith is not, uh, not rock solid. And what about the point of greater heterogeneity? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point. Uh, it was something that's very interesting. And I think it is when you start to see political leaders realizing that they can't win based on scapegoating or ethnic politics because their constituency is so heterogeneous. But that's not something that you can necessarily engineer. You know, it's there or it's not. Um, and I think we can work with those leaders, perhaps, uh, to develop a, a, an alternative discourse that is one of them, greater tolerance. I want to see if Steve or Whitney have any final observations. Um, well, not really. I, I think this has been very thorough, and I congratulate Lauren again for a very uh, good study. Uh, uh, I, I am struck by a lot of the parallels, uh, both historic in South Africa and, and the global parallels that have been drawn, um, including to our own response to immigration and migrant uh, issues. Um, uh, uh, there, there are a few other points that, uh, but I think we'll not belabor them now. They've been they've been addressed to a certain extent, and uh, and and I'll leave those go for the moment. So thank you very much, Lauren. And I would just add, um, I think there's been a very rich discussion, and I think sort of where we leave off is sort of South Africa is a little bit out of fork in the road in terms of the direction it's heading. We're moving into an elections. Will it continue? And Lauren, you're absolutely right. Sort of the the international role that. I think the U.S. and many EU countries and, and others like to see South Africa playing. Will that be seen constructively by the new leadership, by the people of South Africa, or will there be more of a um, withdrawal inward? And, uh, you know, the outcome of that, uh, dis you know, debate is yet to be determined. So look forward to it. Okay. Everybody feel they've had a chance to ask their questions? <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you.